let me add my welcome to the one that has already been offered to you. And we are grateful that you are here on time. Last night, my, my request to Yogesh was that uh, we have to start on time. And uh, he was a little nervous, as he expressed, to say that, you know, there's always this Bangalore traffic. I said, it's a very good excuse. Uh, but I'm delighted that all of you gave importance to this event and were here on time. So uh, when this idea was being thought of and when Bimal and Yogesh talked about it, and they said that, can you be in town? And um, I said, after COVID, I'm just longing to travel. So you have to give me a very weak excuse. So even without knowing what it was, I, I agreed. But as I, as I talked about it, I discovered how important this moment is for me personally. Because about 41 years ago, when we started NIT, we were teaching basic language. That was state of the art. And I said, today here I am looking at, and this term will be coming up very often, the emergent behavior of NIT that I'm here. And I just came to know very recently that this event was planned. And so it gives me great satisfaction that the organization continues to evolve, emerge, driven by leaders such as Vishnu Priya, Dr. Bhatt, and of course, the leadership of Bimal. And so it's a special moment. But it's also a complicated moment because I know nothing about the subject. So they said, you have to speak in the beginning. I said, look, don't put me, don't punish me so much. But I will express a few view views. Um, and <clears throat> what, what inspires me about the subject is the word architecture. So we used to talk of in the good old days when we were consulting for companies in India in the 80s. We, the first set of people who came were youngsters wanting to learn programming. But very shortly thereafter, we started getting requests from the CEOs of companies. They said that we're traveling all over the world to our collaborators, to our suppliers, and we see them using computers and we're using nothing. So you have to help us and our organization that understands what to do with computers. And we used to teach these people ONGC, Indian Oil, the chairman of these companies, CEOs of these companies, that um, when houses were built in the villages, a little cottage with two or three rooms would be built. And then when the son grows up and gets married, you add a room. And then if you had a good harvest, you make another little shed for the cattle. And you build homes that way. We built homes historically that way. Except that when the town started getting developed, you couldn't build homes in the village model. And you had to think of a design. You had to think of a plan. And then space fell short, then you had to start going vertically. And when you had to go vertically, you had many more considerations. And you had to start thinking about safety and security and you know the, the effect to the neighborhood and offset so that if your building falls, it doesn't hurt somebody else. And then from there into communities, and then into cities, and then into mega cities. And I felt that this was a good way to tell people that when you build information systems, you'll have to build your little village homes, this department, that department, then you'll want to connect them, and then you'll worry about security, and all those issues will emerge. <clears throat> but architecture in information design has come a long way. So at the very outset, I want to say I'm really excited that we have so many of you wanting to share your views because many of you are speaking, many of you have posters, so it's not as much as listening but also sharing. And we have a vast range of talks. When I was looking at the list of speakers, which was overpowering for me, of course, there's digital infrastructure, interdisciplinary approaches in building architect ar architecture, open standard interoperability, all of this you know, centralized, decentralized, federated, single system of reference, low code, no code, all these are very strong elements of the larger picture that we call architecture. So I was saying, okay, what, what should inspire us 
what should inspire all of us to build the Taj Mahals of tomorrow, the Burj Khalifas of tomorrow, the tallest building, the marvels uh, of, of many, many things which are happening in an, in an emergent India. Let me use that word again. So it's no surprise that when we look at, at ourselves after 75 years, we see a new self-confidence in the country, a new self-confidence in the Indians. So this is not a surprise that suddenly the country started making these mega statues. Every country in their ascendancy built great things. We have built them thousands of years ago, a thousand years ago, hundreds of years ago. And I think our sector has been the first to get off the blocks after the liberalization process to start building big things. And we built our village homes and now here we are talking about architecture. So what should inspire us? And I'm very, I've become very interested last 20 years in architecture as a field because of my engagement with many institutions, the Indian School of Business, which I'm a co-founder, NIT University, which is now 14 years old. And I'm actively involved in my school where I studied in Gwali it's on a fort. It's a 125 year old school, uh, the Sindhya School, which has buildings which are almost 200 years old. And we are, um, we are restoring them. We're not touching the old building because we can't touch them. They're old, early 1800s buildings. And I'm deeply involved in all these and I just realized how much more interesting that is than doing a little job that we do at a desk. So the first and foremost inspiration has to come from nature's creation, which is the forest, which is as emergent a phenomenon as there ever will be. If you just take a space and put a wall around it and leave it alone, a forest will develop. It's just that we encroach and destroy it. So forest is the most emergent of nature. The birds will eat, throw the seed, seed will fly. And in a university in Nimrana, which I'd love to have you people, you should do a conference there at some point, which is just an hour and a half from Delhi on the way to Jaipur. We have 100 acres with a hillock at the back. It's the Aravalis, which is the oldest fold mountain, millions of years old which run from Delhi all the way to the west of India. Um, so forests have to inspire us. And those of you who, I'm sure all of you are holiday makers, go to the forest next time, but read up about how forests evolve, how they build themselves. There are many lessons. And then of course the field of architecture, which is a few thousand years old in our country. But we have 1250 years ago, the Kailash Nath Temple of Ellora. How many, how many have been to Ellora to see it? Okay, please go and see. To me, it's a very good example of top-down design. A rock which is cut down 107 feet. One acre. God knows how many lakh tons of stone. But not cut and built up. But built from the top. Took 200 years to build. So when you go there now, you have to visualize and imagine what they would have thought of the people who started chipping from the top, made the ceiling, came down, started building the pillars, emptied out the space. Something to learn from those periods of wisdom. So this is the vertical, the top-down structure. And then how many have been to Nalanda to see the old university and the new university which is coming up in Bihar? I strongly recommend, the architect of that happens to be a junior of mine from Sindhya School, He's been inspired in building the old campus by the design of the, the new campus by the design of the old campus. You can Google it and see it. You see there a two-dimensional picture. If I talked of top-down design, this is a two-dimensional picture. All the viharas where these students lived with their teachers on one side of the walkway and the temples on the other side. And the whole idea of this walkway, which is where you walk and talk, which has inspired our own campus, we have a spine with the hostels on one side, the faculty living and the labs along the, on, on the building. So these dimensions of architecture also can open our mind on how to design these extremely complex systems that we're trying to build. But for me, I have to look back at the recent past of what were interesting moments which got me to visualize the idea 
of um, information in its abstract form. There were many things, but 1989, SimCity. How many of you played SimCity? Okay, so SimCity was a very nice game where you were given charge, the PC had come, and you could build your own city. But as you built a city, the system would respond. If you're building a power station, it'll say, oh, this is close, too close to the housing. You better build it far away. Or if you build a police station, they said this is not accessible very quickly to everybody else. So young children trying to build a city and being taught the principles of building a layout. And then shortly thereafter, a very important book which influenced my thinking and I strongly urge, and many of you would have read it by Nicholas Negroponte of MIT, called Being Digital. Thin little book, still available on Amazon, I was seeing this morning. Uh, and he said something which was being said at that time, but he articulated very strongly that with a, we are going from a world that was preoccupied with atoms, materials, to a world which is getting preoccupied with bits. And this transition from atom to bits is a very fundamental transition. And I don't have time to talk about it in detail except to say this that atoms are limited in nature. There's some calculation someone has done, 10 to the power of 83 or some such thing. How many atoms there are in the known universe as we know it. But bits are created products of the mind and they are not limited in nature. If you copy a good piece of music, it's just that many more million bits. And now with higher and higher fidelity, it'll be many more millions of bits. But you can make a perfect copy of the original and make a 10,000 copies by creating more bits. So bits are unlimited in nature. This is a very important aspect because our study of economics, for example, is predicated on demand and supply, which is if demand goes up, prices go up. Till supply comes up, then prices rationalize. But it assumes a limited amount of capacity. With bits, this fundamental, very profound aspect of economics is broken that bits are unlimited in nature. Which is why when we are looking at how many, how we take pictures, each one is a photographer, how many bits we are generating. And therefore the task that all of you have is actually challenging because you cannot put a boundary around the number of bits the world will create. And this was interesting and I urge many of you to to look at this because this was a mind opener to what the world is becoming with unlimited bits. The next one was Bill Gates' book. Uh, uh, the, uh, it was Business at the Speed of Light, I think 1999. And he used the term digital nervous system. He did a very good analogy between the human nervous system where information flows and the organization is also a living being. We are all in the organization and information flows. And he introduced this term and therefore the first linkage of biological information with person-created information. And so by the end of the 90s, personally for me, I was seeing this century as the century, the 21st century, the century of the mind, not of the machine. The century of the machine is behind us. And all of you are architecting images of the mind and for the mind. So you're not architects building rock structures, you're building edifices of information. And the complexity of the fact that these, the raw material is unlimited, the finished good is unlimited, the changing nature, the flexibility, and we'll talk a bit about that because that's one of the things that all of you worry about the most. So we've moved into the post-industrial society in the last century. We are in the knowledge society, and the knowledge is about information. Information is formed in bits, and bits are products of the mind. So I'm just giving you the new context of why is it India's century? We became the, we became the most populous nation somewhere recently, but they're saying by 1st July, we will have proof that India's got the largest number of minds. And in our early days, people, the leaders used to say that population is a liability. And all of us in our field would say that population 
is an asset provided we can get good quality bits going in and good quality bits coming out. That inspired us in a sense to start an IIT. And, and our mission then was bringing people and computers together. Some of you may recall the elder ones will remember. But we changed that recently because we've gone into more than computers. And today this session to be also symbolizes what we are after and our mission is helping people realize their true potential. This is what our mission has evolved into. So anyway, this is now a long history of thousands of years, but let's look at the context today. Because while we can be inspired by the past, we have to be informed by today. And today, <clears throat> the changing context uh, brought into sharp focus by a few recent phenomena, COVID being a very, it's, it's nature created a stress test for mankind of a type we haven't had before for everybody on earth at the same time, the COVID. And that has altered many values and thoughts about life more than many things which happen incrementally. So a few minutes I want to talk on work, the worker and the workplace. All three are dramatically impacted and your job is about the work, the worker and the workplace. That's your job as architects. You have to understand what work is, we have to understand the, the heart and mind of the worker and you are designing workplaces of tomorrow. So the work, I would say, we are moving towards an atomization of work. We are moving to work breakdown structures. We have, we've been doing that for a while, but now it's coming down because even in the factory, there were peace rated workers. People were paid in the mid 1900s by units they produced. So there was a unit of measurement, you make so many little nuts, you get so much, paid so much. And then work got more com complicated. But linking compensation to output was well defined in the manufacturing industrial era, but morphed in the information era because difficult to count output. But we are getting into understanding output. And in fact, in fact, as you people start looking at the automation of work, which is part of what you deal with in architecture, we know that the physical stuff is being done by robots. Software is done is also being done by robots and agents. And the most recent fascinating thing of the auto GPT, just a couple of days old, is where the prompts are being generated by GPT for chat GPT. So the mind is getting out of our heads. We are losing our mind, if I may say, very dangerously. Uh, so the nature of work, therefore, you have to recognize that if you're architects trying to build for people who will come to a workplace and work, what is happening to work? That you have to understand. I don't know it quite well, but that's we have to understand. But we do know that what connects each one of us now is information. So we are connected. We are getting connected at faster and faster speeds. 5G coming now, which people say will change the experience. We have unlimited computing capacity. We have unlimited storage. As architects, you live with that assumption. Okay. So therefore, you are creating an ecosystem where the work is anywhere and anything. And it has to do with bits. And bits move at the speed of light and they work through the organization and the minds of our people. That's the work, the worker. So what democracy has done is to build the individual at the center of governance. And therefore one vote, one person, whether you're Mukesh Ambani or whether it's a guy who's serving UT, one vote. That's a power of democracy. But that democracy is also leading to the assertion of the individual, of their rights, the fundamental rights. And I jump from there to the gig worker of today and moonlighting. And all of the good things we are beginning to see, which people are saying, I will do what I want the way I want, take it or leave it. And of course, when there's shortage of jobs, these youngsters will shout and when there's layoffs, then the big bosses will say, now you stand in a line. So this dynamic, dynamic will go on, 
But the assertion of the individual and the rights of the individual as democracy spreads across the world um, and the, therefore the nature, changing nature of the employment contract. Apparently seven, one guy was working in seven companies in Bangalore, we heard, in the newspapers. Is it right? Is it wrong? There are people who are willing to argue on both sides. So who is your worker you are building the building for? What rule do you have to keep in mind? If he walks into the other company, how do you sec secure your building? Earlier we could put locks. Now you the architects have to build the locks. And then there's the workplace. So COVID has transformed our view of workplace in one year, what the world has taken hundreds of years to do. It's not work from home, it's work from anywhere. That's the norm. So how will you design your system where the worker will, you don't know who he or she is, when they came and went, and where they are at this point in time. Very serious considerations for challenges of architecture. Then, what kind of attributes, and this is not new to you, this is not new to architects all over the world. And flexibility obviously comes up as the very, very first word. And I was speaking to a friend of mine who's building the new Nalanda University. I talked about him. Um, so, and I told him that you've had, you've been inspired by many great architects in the world. So what were their thoughts? What were their mind? What were their ideas? So this is last two days only because I had limited time to do this research and Yogesh helped me and Bimal helped me and I spoke to these few people. So he, he said a few things. He said, in architecture, the idea of a loose fit, don't design, don't build such tight guardrail that you can't change. And I'm sure all of you have this loose fit idea in your mind because you don't know how loose, of course, because bits are unlimited in nature. Every picture creates a few million bits. And we have the most number of people, most active with the cameras. Good morning, everybody says, I don't know why we keep saying good morning and loading our WhatsApp, but we have to say it. And then put flowers and pictures, right? So, <clears throat> so lose fit and reuse. And he gave a good example. He says, if you go into the so-called developed societies, which are perhaps on their way down as, as India emerges and China emerges, he says that as the population go down there, that old railway stations have become places for museums because public can reach easily. They were located in such a way. Or old factories, the tall factories have become art galleries because you need that large expanse. So he says, were they built for that purpose? No, but there was a loose fit. And a loose fit enabled churches. If you go into many parts of Europe, old monuments and church, churches are being let out for restaurants and for people to get together to admire, to be inspired but also to make sure they sustain. Then there's the agility as a second factor, the speed of light. And I, I read a very interesting term called uh, zero latency enterprise. All of you are designing zero latency enterprises. Your users don't want to, they can't wait for two seconds. And chat GPT is telling us that, well, you don't have to wait for minutes to get the most complicated answer on earth. So what are you doing, Mr. Architect, in your company? You say, chat GPT can search trillions of bits and give me a composed poetry in response to a question, then what are you doing sitting and telling me it'll take five days to get a report? So that's a challenge for us. And I think what I also learned, and this is not new, but in architecture, the role of feedback. And if you go to a rock structure, you can't give much feedback except to make it clean and so on. But in your architecture, every transaction is a feedback. Every transaction, customer's transaction, supplier's transaction, is feedback to tell you, did it go on time, did it go right, did not go right, what's different. And therefore, the word feedback and learning have to come together. If you look at startups, we ask them to fail fast. We tell them don't keep failing forever, but some of them make it a habit. But fail fast basically means learn fast, essentially. Learn fast. Take every piece of information. How many are Star Trek freaks here? 
there was this serial cord start sec yeah, gray hair mostly and there was a particular place where captain kirk and his brainy fellow spock land on this new planet and they've got all their powerful devices but suddenly they find that when they're trying to shoot something that's out of a little cave some things come and shoot at them and spock very quickly realizes by the time the third one comes he says they are reacting to every one of our shots they are figuring out how our shots work and the next thing that comes out has learned it to me that was an example of agility that he says we fired two shots this system which is down there which is throwing these little devices coming up has understood what we have and is responding to it so an emergent design is all about that you have to you have to design your architecture to respond very quickly to respond to transaction at a time to fail fast and yet you can't let the organization fail so how do you build structures which can fail fast but don't break a transaction and then there's a lot of work talk about sustainability and i was talking to this architect friend of mine late last night my last third conversation with him and he's been very busy last three days he said you could catch me for 15 minutes at 10 o'clock so after dinner i was <clears throat> chatting with him and he says sustainability we are all talking only of energy and i said of course we have to talk of energy because i read somewhere that one bitcoin takes 1500 kilowatt hours to create and more than that one one fellow in the us did an estimate that in jan jan 23 while chat gpt was being trained the assumption is it took between 1 and 23 so let's say 10 million kilowatt hours that is the amount of energy so i was telling him isn't this awful he says well that's one dimension of sustainability that's right you have to look at economic sustainability you can't go to your boss man in the company and say i need so much money he'll say look that i don't need you because i don't have it so it's economic sustainability viability self self sustaining but i think the the bigger thing he talked to me about sustainability was this emergent nature can we sustain our architecture over time that is the sustainable part because if your system comes down your company comes down if the nervous system stops you know the the the, the, the little device somewhere in our system which triggers the heart and gives it a pulse you know what happens if there's erratic pulses you know if you miss a pulse organization that that dependent on you for the architecture so and then there's scalability i think the lessons for scalability only come to us from nature and um, and therefore the organic nature and we were talking yesterday in this example of benares versus dubai for example low structures very tightly packed so that you you know the energy requirement to cool the houses you see that in rajasthan as well why do they build very compact houses because each house gives shade to the other so the energy required requirement comes down skyscrapers have limitations at most you'll extend a little balcony here or there but short structures can be redone can be tightly packed so you have so many people per hectare of land which is master planning principle then either you make compact small buildings or you make these tall buildings then you have to keep a distance because if it falls like the offset the offsets have to be large and you know that there's a building in noida which had to be brought down why because the offset he consumed it and made another building and people said sorry this is not safe so your architecture is also a big buildings and if they fall they will create problems so how do you build that and so finally as i close because i have promised to keep my part of the deal of being on time and i request everybody to do the same because we are designed we are given this design as organization it architects to be on time is what should be a method by which you try and synthesize 
mankind learning to test your new architecture. And I would propose that when you are doing your architecture, the next one, instead of just having few other architects sharing your design, put together a team of a social psychologist, you get enough in Bangalore, of architecture historians, you get a lot in Bangalore, you get very good architects, all great architects have studied history and architecture. Anthropologists, fewer of them, but remember mankind is a story of cumulative racial learning. So if you if someone comes into a party with a black trouser and a red shirt, most commonly people say, you look deadly. And we have our principal chief scientist, Sugata. He told me once, he said, think of the cave and it's dark and the lion comes in and there's blood. It is red and it's black. Anyway, that was an extension of anthropology, but anthropologists help us understand human behavior. And then the more recent organization development experts were dealing with the work and the worker, the worker more than anything else. And eventually, I would say, and perhaps most importantly, you have to get a bunch of digital natives, the people who will live in the architectures that you build. Get this team and present your stuff and you'll be forced to tell your story. Yogesh made me, brought, brought me alive to this, that your story has to be understood by all these people sitting in the room. Then they can respond to you. Then they can give you the input that you need to have better architecture. Thank you so much.